Hi, my name is Nancy Reed. I'm a physician assistant and I am doing the ophthalmology review and this lecture will, for the most part, follow the pants and pan re-blueprint. But we're going to go over a few things, just a little reminder of anatomy and physiology, which is going to help clarify some of the disorders a little bit later on down the line. And then we're going to just talk about some special testing um, in, that is used in the field of ophthalmology that you may have not already previously discussed in physical diagnosis lab. So before we start, we're going to talk about a few things. Ophthalmology. Ophthalmology is actually um, misspelled quite frequently, and the reason that is is the H is left out after the P. So just make sure that you have the proper spelling of ophthalmology. And throughout this lecture, we're going to talk about some things that you need to know. Some things you're going to need to know um, for clinical practice, um, such as diagnosis. You must know how to do a good physical exam. And then treatment. A lot of eye conditions are referred to ophthalmologists. So, um, but we're going to talk about the treatments. And then there's some items that you need to know for pants and panry. There are things that you may not see very often, but they make really good test questions on standardized tests. And then finally, some things to keep you out of court. And that's two of the biggest things is when to refer and when not to refer. And then finally, we're going to teach you some things that you will need to know for your test in this um, block of instructions. So you're going to have to pay attention. So first, we're going to just do a little review of the internal eye, external eye, physical exam, and special test. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the anatomy of the external eye. Um, the medial uh, canthus and the lateral canthus um, are depicted here. And the, one of the big things about the medial canthus um, near there is the puncta where the lacrimal system drains into the nasal lacrimal um, uh, the nasal lacrimal system that goes into the nose. So uh, the sclera is the uh, portion of the eye uh, covered by the conjunctiva. And the conjunctiva is a mucous membrane that covers the eye. It's semi-transparent and it starts at the edge of the cornea. And then you have the bulbal, bulbar conjunctiva, which covers the sclera and the palpebral conjunctiva, which covers the inside of the eye. So the bulbar conjunctiva is what you see in the palpebral conjunctiva. You have to turn the eyelids um, inside out in order to be able to see um, that. Next, we're gonna talk about the iris. The iris is a pigmented muscle, and it's important to realize that it is a muscle, and it controls the amount of light going into the retina. There's two uh, muscles, there's a sphincter, uh, pupilla, which is the inner muscle, and the dilator pupilla, which is the outer muscle. The pupil is the black, dark opening of the eye, and that is important um, because you'll look at the pupil size in many um, different conditions, such as uh, acute angle closure or acute closed angle glaucoma. And then finally, the limbus. The limbus is the junction where the sclera meets the cornea. So here on the outer edge is the sclera, and here is the cornea. And the important part about the limbus is that's where new cells are made um, that are generated to um, revitalize the cornea. So the cells are made in this limbic region, and then they move inward. So the cornea is the clear part of the eye and it's avascular. Um, the cornea uh, is, think of that as like the windshield of the car. It has to be clear in order for you to see out of it. It has to be smooth. If it's not, it, you can have visual acuity issues. The mammobian glands are oil secreting glands and they help to keep the eye from drying out. They also so secrete oil, which helps the tear film um, uh, stay in place. It keeps it from evaporating quickly. You also have the levator palpebral muscle. That's what elevates the eye and opens the eye. And the nerve that um, innervates that is cranial nerve three. 
And then you also have the uh, orbicularis oculi, which closes the eye, um, eyelid, and it is innervated by cranial nerve 7. So let's talk a little bit about how the eye stays hydrated. This is very, very important because if the eye does not stay hydrated, if the tear film doesn't stay in place, the eye will dry out and you can develop corneal um, ulcers and corneal lesions because the tear film is not keeping the cornea hydrated. So whenever we start thinking about um, tear production, the tear production um, occurs in the lacrimal gland and the lacrimal gland is in within the bony orbit above the eye. And the tear film is then produced and it washes over top of the eye, washes over the cornea, and it is kept in a trough in the bottom of the eyelid. So the eyelid at the bottom forms a trough. And so every time you blink, that trough of uh, tears is washed over the cornea. Whenever the tear film does drain out of the eye, it drains out from the puncta, which is over by the medial canthus area. It goes from the puncta into the canicula, then from the canicula into the lacrimal sac, and then into the nasolacrimal duct. And it's really important that you understand this um, uh this process because there's a lot of pathology that can occur here if the tears um, are not maintained on the eye or if there's uh, an infection of the laser lacrimal sac or nasolacrimal duct. Um, you also have accessory tear glands in the eyelid and in the conjunctiva. So this is one of the most important slides in the entire slide deck. If you don't have a good understanding of the cranial nerves of the eye, you're going to have a hard time answering questions for the pants and pan re exam. So, a lot of the um, questions will have some portion of a cranial nerve embedded in the question. So, the way I like to tell people to re um, remember this um, is that think of it like a chemical symbol LR6. SO4 R3, meaning the lateral rectus is in, innervated by cranial nerve 6, the superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve 4, and the inferior oblique, the med medial rectus, inferior rectus, and superior rectus are all innervated by cranial nerve 3. So that's again LR6 SO4 R3. And that's going to help you um, keep things, um, uh, helps re remind you what cranial nerves innervate what muscles. So let me talk a little bit more about the cranial, uh, the ocular muscles and their cranial nerve innervation. So the ocular muscles, specifically the superior and inferior rectus, and the lateral and medial rectus set on the eye at a particular distance from the um, limbus. So for instance, on the lateral rectus, muscle is about seven millimeters from the limbus. It's about 5.5 millimeters from the rectus. Now, I don't want you to memorize these numbers, but I want you to understand that if for some reason there's a misplacement of these muscles, let's hypothetically say that the medial rectus is misplaced on the eye and is setting at 3.5 millimeters. That might pull the eye medially because of misplacement of the eye muscles. And that's going to come into play when we talk about strabismus. So sometimes those eye muscles are misplaced on the eye and it can cause the eye to um, come out of eye alignment. The next thing I want to talk about is the oblique muscles. What is really confusing about the oblique muscles is they're named by where they attach, but they actually do just the opposite. So the, the superior oblique muscle is attached on the superior portion of the eye, but because of this trochlea, this pulley system, whenever the superior oblique fires, it actually moves the eye downward. 
and the inferior oblique, when the muscle fires, it actually moves the eye upward. So just keep in mind that the superior oblique is named for where they attach and not the action that they make the eye go into. So this is just a summary um, of the eye muscles and if there is paralysis, what will happen to the eye and the actions that normally occur. So the medial rectus muscle uh, makes the eye move inward. The inferior oblique makes the eye go up and in. The superior oblique makes the eye go down and in. The lateral rectus makes the eye go out. The superior rectus is up and out and inferior rectus is down and out. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the circulation of aqueous humor. It's important to know uh, what happens with the aqueous, aqueous humor because this plays a role in um, glaucoma, acute angle glaucoma and chronic uh, glaucoma. So whenever aqueous humor is produced, it's produced in the ciliary bodies. So here's the ciliary bodies. And from the ciliary bodies, the fluid goes into the posterior chamber. So this is the portion of the posterior chamber. It washes over the lens, again, to kind of hydrate the lens. And it goes through the pupil into the anterior chamber. From the anterior chamber, it goes to the trabecular meshwork and then out the canalish limb and back into circulation. So if there is an imbalance on how much is produced and how much is drained out, that can cause issues with glaucoma. We're gonna talk a little bit about the internal eye anatomy. Now, this is what makes the eye so intimidating because in physical diagnosis lab, we do not dilate the eye and it makes it really hard to see the back of the eye. So you have to kind of learn the internal anatomy of the eye based on pictures and not so much what you see on physical diagnosis because you don't see a lot of these structures well unless you have a dilated eye. So the choroid is the middle layer of the eye. The retina is the inner layer of the eye which senses light. And the vitreous humor is the gel inside the eye that gives the eye sh its shape. If you have a globe rupture and the vitreous humor comes out, then the eye becomes misshaped. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about trauma. The optic disc um, is where the optic nerve enters the back of the eye. And it's about 1.5 millimeters in diameter. Um, it's the posterior pole of the retina, and it's usually like a yellowish or pink in color and it's the like I said the head of the optic nerve and that's where all the central retinal veins and arteries um, originate so generally um, without an undilated eye you can see the optic disc and you can see the veins and arteries generating from the optic disc area now the physiologic cup is the center of the optic disc and the normal um, ratio is about one third of the disc diameter should be the physiologic cup. If that uh, is off, let's say the physiologic cup is 90% of the optic disc, then you have pathology and that's called papilledema. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. The macula is an area of, um, in the back of the eye that has no vessels and that's where the keenest vision is. And the fovea is the central um, portion of the macula where the cones are. Um, and then again, the lens is in the, the um, front portion um, and it is behind the iris and it changes shape by the ciliary body pulling on it. So the ciliary body is a muscle and they, they pull on the lens and it changes the shape. So here's a picture. You have the arteries and veins originating from the optic disc. The um, uh, physiologic cup is about one third of the overall diameter of the optic disc. You have the macula and then the fovea. 
And then here you have the lens and you can't see, but imagine ciliary bodies right here. And that's what changes the shape of the lens. Those muscles pull on the lens and it changes the shape of the lens. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in just a second when we talk about presbyopia. So here is again a up close version of what you should see if you're looking in the back of the eye. But again, it's very difficult to do that without seeing it with a dilated eye. So on physical exam, I like to tell people just try to get in to a um, rhythm where you do the same thing every time. And so the visual acuity is the vital signs for the eye. You need to do the visual acuity with and without correction and you also need to do it near for near vision and far vision. Um, near vision if the person is around age 40, because near vision starts to fail late 30s, beginning of 40s um, for some folks. And so again, this is the vital sign of the eye. Usually this is done by a medical assistant prior to the, the patient even getting to you. But you have to make sure that your medical assistants um, know how to really do a good visual acuity. Inspection. So I like to tell um, people that inspection is one of the main tools that you have to actually make diagnosis. We're gonna talk a little bit um, in the live portion of this uh, about test and special test and how you actually diagnose a condition. So a lot of eye conditions, literally, you don't even have to do a special test. You diagnose them by just actually looking at the person's eye. You don't have to really do a lot of anything. And a lot of the conditions that we're gonna talk about, you can make the diagnosis based on inspection alone. So don't underestimate the importance of inspection. Pupillary function, again, you're gonna inspect the pupils. You're gonna see how they react to light. So you're gonna turn the lights down in the room that you're in, take a pin light and shine it into the pupil. And then you're gonna do a near reaction. It's also known as accommodation. And you document that as PERLA. Pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodate. If you do not test accommodation, you just annotate it as PERL, P-E-R-R-L. Next, ocular motility. You're gonna do the extraocular movements. I like to tell people that this is the action H. So you make an H with your finger and have them follow it. You have to also make sure that you um, do not have, the patient should not be moving their head. They need to only move their eyes. You should also check convergence. It's where you take your finger and you move it slowly in to the tip of their nose and their eyes should both turn in the, this is one of the only times when the, both the medial rectus muscles are pulling the eyes in together. Usually when you do eye motions, if the left eye's lateral rectus muscle is firing, the right eye's medial rectus muscle is firing. So just the opposite muscles are um, acting in this. But with convergence, both medial rectus muscles are pulling the eyes inward. And then you should also do cover, uncover test cover, cross cover test, and Hirschberg's corneal light test. And you may or may not have talked about these in um, physical diagnosis lab previously, but we're gonna show you a video a little bit later when it comes to strabismus, and it's gonna go over cover, uncover, cover, cross cover, and Hirschberg's. You should do a quick visual fields test. You should also do anterior chamber testing. And then finally, fundoscopic exam, which includes the red reflex. And I can't emphasize enough the red re reflex, um, main uh, making sure you get a red reflex, especially in a pediatric population, which we'll talk more about when we talk about retinoblastoma. So let's talk a little bit about refractive errors. So emetropia is when you have normal perfect vision, 2020. The parallel light rays fall precisely on the back of the retina. So those people do not have to use any glasses. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about presbyopia. Presbyopia um, occurs, again, late 30s, early 40s for some people. And what happens is the lens hardens with age. Now the lens actually starts hardening 
much earlier, and they think it's because of proteins being deposited on the lens makes it less pliable. But you don't start to see the effects until late 30s or early 40s. And I like to tell people that it's like um, when you see somebody holding something in front of their face and then they start reading it and they have to move it inwards and outwards, that's them moving the object so it's a comfortable distance. And it's because their lens is no longer moving. And so when you see somebody doing that, you know they have presbyopia. When they're moving the, the article that they're reading so that it's a comfortable distance. So that lens becomes less pliable, the patient loses the ability to make the lens rounder, and you'll have progressive de decrease in near vision. Now you also may have decrease in accommodations, and a lot of people will need bifocals at this time. Um, a, an option to bifocals nowadays, which are really nice, are called progressive lenses, and they don't have the line anymore. Back in the old days, there used to be a line where you would look above the line, and that was for people who needed help with distant vision, and then you would look below the line, and that's where you would, um, you, you would use to see near vision. Though that line has now gone away, and they have progressive lenses. Now, why is that important? It's important because now it's hard to tell if somebody's wearing glasses for near vision and distant vision. So you have to ask them, do you wear progressive lenses? They, they, they may not know what their eye condition is, but if you ask them, do you have progressive lenses? Then, then you know that they have a near vision problem and they have a far vision problem as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, refractive error myopia. That is whenever the person has difficulty seeing far away. They can see up close nicely, but they can't see far away. And what happens with this is the light rays falls in front of the retina. Instead of hitting the retina in the back of the eye, it's falling before the eye and the distant image is blurred. And the reason people have myopia is because their eyeball is too long. Now it's important to remember that piece. Myopia, the eyeball is too long because myopic people are at increased risk of having retinal detachments, which we will talk about later um, in this course. Hyperopia is whenever people have difficulty seeing close up. They can see far away nicely, but the light rays falls behind the retina. And so close images are blurred and it's because the eyeball is too short or the cornea is flat. So here's a nice summary slide. You have normal vision, that light rays falls perfectly right on the back of the eye. It converges right on the back of the eye, but with a myopic, um, eye or a nearsighted person, the light rays hits before the retina, and in a hyperoptic or farsighted person, the light rays hits behind the um, eye or behind the retina. So that's refractive errors. And then the last refractive error we're going to talk about is astigmatism. And so an astigmatism is an error focusing um, an error in the focusing ability of the eye. The light is not uniformly focused in all directions. So generally, a cornea is nice, smooth, and dome-shaped. When somebody has an astigmatism, their cornea has irregularities on it, and it is um, it's it causes unequal curvature in the front surface of the cornea, so it's not spherical. And these people will have just distorted vision. So on the left-hand side is a picture of what um, it might look like to somebody who has an astigmatism. And you can see like his nose is clear, but his hair is, you know, not correct. And so that's an astigmatism. So now let's talk a little bit about special tests. In the slide earlier, I talked about some tests that you do um, as part of the normal eye exam. Now these are special tests that you may or may not have depending on what setting that you work in. So for instance, if you work in a family practice, um, you may not have access to fluorescein stain. You may have it. You would definitely have access to fluorescein stain in an urgent care or an ER setting. 
Tonometry, again, you wouldn't typically have access to tonometry in a family practice setting, but you would expect to have it in most ER settings, maybe not in urgent care settings. So again, we're gonna talk about these special tests. So Humphrey's visual fields test, Ishihara test for color blindness, slit lamp, and dilation of pupils. So fluorescein stain, what we do here is we take fluorescein stain and you will put a couple of drops on this orange tip. You will have the person look up and away and you touch the orange tip down here um, to um, the, uh, you can touch it to the um, sclera or into the um, inner lid. And then you have the person close their eyes and blink, blink, blink. And then what happens is if there's any breakup of the epithelium, the penetration of the fluorescein stain goes into those breaks in epithelium and uh, lights up with this bright green light. And um, you have a fluorescein stain. You have to turn off the light in the exam room and you have a special light that will light up and you will see this bright green if there is like a corneal lesion or corneal ulcer. So this is um, a corneal abrasion, something scraped across this cornea in this um, patient. Tonometry. So on a tonometry, you're trying to measure interocular pressure. So there's a couple of different ways to measure interocular pressure. There is one which called, is called a tonopin, and the tonopin, you have to numb the eye up, and then you touch the eye, and you take the average of three readings. On a non-contact tonometry, it's called a puff test. And what happens is there's a puff of air that is um, shot at the eye. And the harder the eye is, the more air um, is reflected back. The softer the eye, the less air is reflected back. So tonal pins are generally found in like an ER setting. The non-contact tonometry, those are usually seen in optometry or ophthalmology um, clinics. So depending on the reference that you that you um, look at, sometimes they'll say that normal interocular pressure is 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, it, it kind of varies between 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury depending on what reference you're using. So anything in that 10 to 20 millimeter um, millimeters of mercury is a normal interocular pressure. Again, some references may say 12 to 15. So I just make it 10 to 20 to kind of give you a really good um, idea of uh, what a, the range might be depending on the reference that you look. Now, I wanna tell you a poor man's way to measure interocular pressure. And it, it sounds kind of inhumane, but if you are in a remote site and you don't have access to tonometry, all you have to do is have the patient close their eyes and you palpate the eye. So if you palpate one eye, it will feel, it, a normal eye should feel like, uh, almost like a hard boiled egg that has been taken out of the shell. That's like the normal pressure of an eye. If you palpate somebody who has increased interocular pressure, it will feel more like a golf ball. It'll be very hard. So that's a poor man's way of checking interocular pressure. But again, if you aren't in an ER setting, you may have a, a tono pin. So Humphrey's visual fields test. So when we do physical exam, when we're checking visual fields in a, like a setting, let's say a family practice setting, what you do is you have the person cover their left eye and then you come in from behind them waving your fingers and you say, when do you see this? and you document at what angle they see your fingers. If you have an abnormal screening of a visual fields test doing that method, then you need to send them on to ophthalmology or optometry, whichever one is appropriate based on what disease you think they have, and they can do what's called a, visual, a Humphrey visual fields test. And what happens is the patient puts their face into this machine and there's blinking lights and the person is supposed to um, push a button every time they see a blinking light. And if they miss the blinking light, the um, 
the uh, machine will know where, where they're missing the blinking light. So you can see here in this eye, these squares is where the person has missed these lights. So in this upper outer region, the person has decreased um, peripheral vision. So that's a Humphrey visual fields test. So again, just to reiterate, you do the manual test in the office, and if you have any suspicion that that is um, abnormal, or you think the person has a condition like um, chronic glaucoma, then you can send them on and they can do a Humphrey visual fields test. So the Humphrey visual fields test, you'll generally find these only in optometry or ophthalmology clinics. Slit lamp is a binocular mi uh, microscope which shows three-dimensional view of the eye. It's used to in inspect the anterior segment of the eye. So the um, cornea, the anterior chamber, and you can see the lens. You will f quite frequently see a slit lamp in an uh, ER. You typically won't have that in a urgent care or a family practice setting. Um, but if you're going to work in an emergency room setting and you want to be an ERPA, you will get to be very proficient at using a slit lamp to, um, to, pr to view the anterior segments of the eye. Ishihara test is for color blindness. Um, this is typically seen in uh, occupational medicine clinics where people are trying to get jobs as firefighters, as um, police officers, pilots, because you have to be able to see different color of lights and things like that. So Ishihara tests, um, they, like we would ask, what number do you see in the top? And if the person has red color blindness, they're not going to be able to see that that's a six. Or in the bottom, you say, what number do you see? That's a 12. Um, so Ishihara test is for color blindness. Um, it's more in depth. You can do a, on the Snellen eye chart, there's usually a red line and a green line and you can ask them, what color do you see here? What color do you see here? That's a, a smaller version of colorblind test. This is the more in depth version. And then finally, let's talk about a dilated eye. Um, in a family practice setting and sometimes in an urgent care setting, but not generally, you usually don't dilate an eye. And Dilated eyes are usually seen, we do this more in an emergency room setting and then in optometry and ophthalmology. And unfortunately, if you don't dilate the eye, you don't get a really good look at the back of the eye. You can see from the picture below at the increased um, area that you can see on that dilated eye. So uh, again, in most settings that PAs work in, you don't get to see the back of the eye after it's been dilated. So that's again what makes retinal diseases very scary to us as PAs because we don't really get to look at the backs of eyes and get to see a lot of the structures to, to be able to identify what's normal versus what's abnormal. So again, let's just review real quick. Cranial nerves of the eye, cranial nerve three opens the eye via the levator palpebral, and it also constricts the pupil. Cranial nerve seven closes the eye and is responsible for tear production. Cranial nerve two transmits visual information from the retina to the brain. And then lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six. Superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve four and the rest are innervated by cranial nerve three. And oblique muscles are named for where they attach on the eye, not how they move the eye. And then finally, if, it, if you have a clinical scenario question and it involves uh, abnormality of the lid or the pupil and the eye is down and out, it's cranial nerve three until proven otherwise. So if any kind of scenario question that comes to you, there's a lid drooping, abnormality in the pupil and the eye is down and out, it's a cranial nerve three. So let's talk a little bit about um, some eyelid disorders. So this is part of the recorded lecture. In order to save um, time with the live lesson, these are some things that you've covered during your physical diagnosis. Um, uh, class, but I wanted to go over them really quickly one more time and add the treatment with those. 
So blepharitis is a chronic bilateral inflammation of the lid margins. What happens is the turnover of skin cells kind of build up around the eyelid margin. And um, it can be because of ulcerative, staphylococcal, or seborrheic um, origins. Signs and symptoms include irritation, burning and itching, red-rimmed eyes, or scaling or la- scales on the lash. This can go on to cause um, backing up of the mamobian glands, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So it can lead to uh, other problems besides just blepharitis. And the key thing about this is it's really, really easy to treat. The best thing to do is just get some baby shampoo, put it on a washcloth, uh, a warm, wet washcloth, and you just exfoliate by scrubbing the lid margins. Um, If you have swelling or it looks like there's an inflammatory process starting, you can add some anti-staph antibiotic ointment such as bacitracin or erythromycin. So again, here is an example. You can see this debris just building up at the base of the lashes and that's blepharitis. Chalazione is a chronic granulatomous inflammation of the mabobian gland. So signs and symptoms include a non-tender, so it's not tender, hard swelling on the upper or lower lid. So chalazians are non-tender, that's the most important thing, and they're chronic. And it's again, it's the chronic buildup of uh, granulous material underneath the eyelid. And signs and our treatment for this is if you um, put warm compresses on it, sometimes the warm compresses will help to drain this. But if it becomes very big and it starts pushing on the eye, causing distortion of the visual acuity, you may have to do interlesional steroids to help shrink um, the mass, or you can do incision and curatage where they go in and cut it out. So here's a couple examples of chalazion. And as you can see, when they become quite big, they can push on the cornea and that can um, distort the light entering the eye and they can cause visual acuity issues. Hordeolum is an acute inflammation. So the other is a chronic, hordeolum is acute. And because it's acute, it is acutely tender. And it's usually due to staphylococcal um, abscess. So you'll have localized red, swollen, acutely tender area on the upper or lower lid. Um, You can have it internally where it points um, inward, or you can have it externally where it's pointing outward at the lid margins. And if it's um, pointing inward, it's an inflammation of the mobian gland. And if it's external, it's an inflammation of the glands of Zeiss and Mall. So again, easy peasy, warm compress. So both conditions, you just start with warm compress. And if the um, if the warm compresses don't take care of the hordeolum, you can add an antibiotic ointment, bacitracin or erythromycin, and incision and drainage if um, there's no resolution with conservative treatment. So cut it open, drain, drain out the um, infection. So again, if someone has blepharitis, the blepharitis can go on and cause hordeolum. So it's important to treat the blepharitis so that you don't have an acute inflammation um, of these glands. So here's an example. Um, the lower lid is an internal um, hordeolum and the upper lid is an external hordeolum. So I like to tell people H hordeolum hurts. And if it hurts, it's an acute process. Chalazion is C, chronic, so it doesn't hurt. Entropion is the inward turning of the eyelids, typically the lower eyelids. This is seen in older people as the laxity of the lid fascia starts to occur. The eyelid will turn in, uh, the uh, eyelids turn inward. And then what happens is the eyelashes can scratch across the cornea and cause corneal um, scarring. uh, And you can also have contracture of tissue. So treatment, um, surgery if there's corneal abrasions happening, and botulism 
um, toxin injections might be a temporary fix for those people who may not be good surgical candidates. So here's entropian. You can see his eyelids are turning inward. Every time this person blinks his eyes, those eyelids are scratching across his um, uh, cornea and it can cause corneal abrasions and eventually corneal ulcers. Ectropion is an outward turning of the lower lid. It's also commonly seen in elderly, but it can also be seen as a complication of a lower blepharoplasty where they're trying to um, tighten the skin below the eyes and they over tighten and then um, it pulls the eyelid outward. Now, the problem with this, with that eyelid turning outward, now those tears that we talked about um, back in the lacrimal um, system, those tears are not caught in the trough. Instead, they run off down the person's cheek. And now every time you blink, the, um, the tears are not being washed over the cornea and it allows the eye to dry out. And as the eye dries out, they're set up to have um, exposure keratitis. And exposure keratitis can lead to corneal abrasions and corneal ulcers. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about exposure keratitis a little bit later. So the treatment for this is you absolutely have to keep the eye hydrated. And that is done by doing artificial tears multiple times throughout the day to make sure that the cornea is staying hydrated as well as the rest of the eye. And then one of the um, treatments for this is you can do surgery to tighten the lid muscles. So on the left hand side there, you can see this person has an ectropion and that eyelid is turned outward. So therefore the trough is not there. It, the eye, the tears are not getting caught. And most likely if you saw this person in real life and watched them over time, you'll see tears dra draining down their cheeks. So that is the end of this. Um, I would like you to watch this um, at some point in time. Uh, before the test because there are test questions on this. Um, we will convene with live, sec live um, sessions later this week. Thanks.